he was supposed to be the supreme leader of a master race. A paragon of physical and mental health to lead Germany to a glorious future. But behind the Führer facade was a fragile pill popper. Dependent on a dubious daily diet of injections, tablets and tonics. In just a few years, the almighty Führer was reduced to a feeble, trembling figure. Much of the Führer's medical history was lost, but not all. A series of intriguing records and letters have come to light, revealing Hitler's medical secrets. Evidence of drug abuse, sex stimulants, and psychological breakdowns. At the center of it all, the Führer's infamous personal physician, Dr. Theodore Morell. When the American interrogators of Morell found out all the different 28 treatments he was giving, like the ground bull testis and the semen and the prostate glands and so on, some of them wondered whether he was a double agent, whether he had purposefully, in a way, made Hitler so much um, di un dysfunctional that he couldn't win, he couldn't achieve what he wanted. Theodor Morell was the Führer's trusted personal doctor for nine years. Hitler heaped praise and honors upon him, but other Nazi doctors despised him, dismissed him as a quack, and blamed him for the dictator's dramatic deterioration. Other Nazi doctors within Hitler's circle poured scorn upon Morell, described him as a quack, a charlatan, a complete phony, and insinuated that he had done a lot of damage to Hitler. After the war, the obese doctor confessed to administering a cocktail of drugs opiates, morphine, barbiturates, and possibly amphetamines, leading to speculation that his treatment caused the dictator's extreme behavior. We call it rapid cycling, constant rapid cycling. Uh, I don't think that Hitler had a day of normal mood, in, in my reading of this, from about 1942 to 1945. Sensational evidence has emerged of a Führer of his face, a hapless hypochondriac, a high Hitler. The problem is not that Hitler got amphetamines. That's not it. It's not that Hitler was an amphetamine addict, which people have brought up. It's that Hitler had bipolar disorder, and he got amphetamines, which worsened his bipolar disorder. That's the issue. It's the interaction between the amphetamines and the bipolar disorder, and that's never been described before. And I think that could explain a lot of why Hitler changed in the late 1930s and 1940s. Other tantalizing evidence has emerged, pointing to a possible march to mental deterioration. Much has been made of the mass hysteria and delusion of those who flocked to his rallies. But it seems possible that Hitler himself suffered a fateful breakdown long before he became Führer. The great warrior had been rejected by his native Austrian army in the First World War. Hitler joined the Germans and later claimed he was wounded, blinded in a British gas attack. In the last phases of the war, about two-thirds to three-quarters of all the shells fired were gas shells. It had become a gas war. Mustard gas does cause temporary blindness, sometimes longer-term blindness, um, and there is evidence that Hitler suffered from conjunctivitis after the attack. The Austrian volunteer was evacuated to the sanctuary of a military hospital in Pusewalk, far from the front lines to the north of Berlin. During his recovery, the war ended, and the embellishment of his exploits in the trenches began. Hitler described his alleged wounding as a decisive moment, a political awakening in his rambling manifesto Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. The more I tried to clearly understand these incredible events, the more I felt the burning shame of deep indignation and disgrace. What was the pain in my eyes compared to this misery? So I decided to become a politician.
in his own account, this was the moment where the world went black, uh, um, everything collapsed that he'd lived for, and where he realized then that the Jews were the hated enemy behind all this, and that at that moment he said, I took the decision to enter politics. But other evidence suggests that Hitler wasn't blinded by gas, but by a kind of nervous breakdown or hysterical blindness. We now know that in all probability, Hitler didn't lose his eyesight through mustard gas, but that it was a psychosomatic blindness. Hitler's alleged hysterical breakdown was detailed in a report compiled for American intelligence during the Second World War. It also described the dictator as neurotic, bordering on psychotic, with masochistic tendencies and strong sexual perversions. And recently, more evidence has emerged about Hitler's blindness and breakdown in the First World War. It's a letter in which a renowned German neurosurgeon says he'd seen Hitler's medical file and that the dictator was treated for a psychiatric disorder that can cause blindness. It's quite interesting that Hitler, who later portrayed himself as invincible, that even he could no longer carry on in the autumn of 1918, that his nerves could no longer take the strain and that it led to this loss of sight. Perhaps Hitler covered up what at that time was considered shameful, that he was too weak or feeble-minded to fight. Neuropaths were stigmatized at the time, and even today, people suffering from depression, burnout, or other psychological illnesses are not altogether accepted. And in the Weimar Republic, this would have been a real stigma and would have made Hitler unelectable. Admission records for the first war military hospital at Puzzewalk still exist in a Berlin archive. According to the register, Private Adolf Hitler was admitted for gas poisoning. The admission records for the military hospital Passawalk are clear. Gas poisoning. That's it. There was never any talk of psychological illness. Intriguingly, soldiers were also treated for psychological disorders and venereal disease at Pazavalk. When you look at the hospital records, you can see that there were people with gas injuries, also those with psychological disorders, but more than any other, there were people with sexually transmitted diseases. Perhaps this was a source for the rumors that Hitler had syphilis, but there's no evidence for this or other lurid claims, like the story about the dictator only having one testicle. This comes from a, a silly song that the British troops used to sing called Colonel Bogey, and it's just a joke. There are, again, medical examination records from the 1930s and early 40s that show he was fully equipped, as it were. There's another rumour that spread that his penis was bitten off by a goat when he was a child. There's absolutely no evidence for that either. But there does seem to be evidence pointing to some kind of mental condition and a sinister cover-up. The historian Thomas Weber claims that Hitler was treated by a neurologist at Puzzewalk, Dr. Edmund Forster. He suspects that Forster's apparent suicide in 1933 was murder, to cover up Hitler's potentially damaging mental breakdown. But fellow historian Henrik Ebele is among the doubters. Edmund Forster, who later became quite a famous neurologist, didn't treat Adolf Hitler. Forster was never in Passawalk. That's quite clear. He wasn't there. Hitler's alleged hysterical breakdown remains the subject of debate, but there's little doubt that the tale of a sudden political awakening was mere propaganda. Hitler was blinded by mustard gas poisoning, I think is correct, and, um, and that the effects of that uh, must have been horrible, and that 
intensified the bitterness that he felt towards everything that had happened. But he wasn't an anti-Semite, and now all at once he was. That doesn't seem to me to be realistic. However far-fetched his story was, millions fell for it. Hitler's rambling manifesto became a bestseller, but not everyone was convinced. Many were mesmerized by the dictator's extreme rants. Others saw them as signs of psychological illness. As well as rumors of a first war breakdown, another alleged report of unstable behavior emerged from his time as a failed artist in Austria. Hitler's childhood friend, August Kubitzek, published his memoirs after the Second World War. One scene painted a portrait of a disturbed young man who would go on to become Führer. Adolf had reached an almost ecstatic state, but then he described the future which was filled with threats and danger. And at the same time, he was obviously fighting the tears. If one takes a psychiatric textbook description of depression and mania and then reads Kubisek's account of what Hitler was like as a young man, it's hard not to see almost a direct translation. Perhaps August Kubitzek witnessed a moment of mania, an insight into a deluded mind that would lead Germany and much of Europe to destruction. If Hitler was manic depressive, it didn't stop him from reaching the summit of absolute power. His Bavarian retreat was off limits to all but the closest cronies. Like secret girlfriend Eva Braun and Dr. Theodor Morell, Morell treated the rich and famous on Berlin's prestigious Kurfürstendamm, specializing in venereal disease. He treated Hitler's personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, for gonorrhea. When the Führer had an apparently incurable condition, Hoffmann knew who to recommend. In 1936, he was suffering from uh, a problem of eczema, which med his medical advisors could not deal with very well. And Hoffmann recommended Morel, whom he knew. Morel treated him, the eczema went away, and he had a very comforting, soothing bedside manner, which Hitler liked. As well as eczema, the Führer was stricken with stomach cramps and chronic flatulence. Hitler tended to talk while he was eating, and thus ingesting air, and that made him belch quite a lot. And he had irritable bowel syndrome, as we would now call it. Hitler liked pea soup in particular, and Morel tried to cut down on the amount of pea soup he ate, because that's another thing that contributed to his flatulence. Morel prescribed a so-called probiotic containing non-harmful bacteria. The cramps and eczema apparently receded. The delighted dictator appointed him as his personal physician, to the disgust of his cronies. Dr. Morel was a rather unpleasant person, at least most people in Hitler's entourage found him unpleasant. He was overweight, he was a bit of a slob, he was a noisy, messy eater. He was something of a glutton who shoved food down himself. He had a rather strong and unpleasant body odor. But Hitler, when he was faced with criticisms of Dr. Morell of this kind, said, I don't employ Dr. Morell for his fragrance. I employ him to look after my health. The already affluent doctor became a high flyer. He landed the title of professor and a property on the exclusive Schwanenwerder Island on the outskirts of Berlin. He joined the top dogs of the Nazi elite like Albert Speer and Josef Goebbels, who'd moved into the homes of Jewish millionaires. Even though she described Morell as disgusting, his officer pigsty, Eva Braun still visited him. Eva Braun was very careful to cultivate the people who were powerful in Hitler's circle as she herself came to gain more influence over the years. And Morel was certainly, from 1936 onwards, one of the key people in Hitler's entourage whom she needed to make friends with. Perhaps the Führer's girlfriend also benefited from Morel's medicine bag. As well as pills and potions, he gave Hitler sex hormone injections, some extracted from the prostate glands of young bulls. 
Was it ammunition the Nazi dictator needed to mount amorous offensives in the bedroom? They basically increased vigor. The testosterone was used to strengthen sexual virility. The question is if Morel was looking into that for Hitler. Hitler's relationship with girlfriend Eva Braun was a state secret. She was 23 years younger. Morel's notes suggest he may have provided the boost his Führer needed to keep up with his frisky Fräulein. If you look at when he gave Hitler a preparation called Testoviron, which is a kind of testosterone preparation, it is usually before Hitler goes and spends the night with Eva Braun. Eva Braun was young, fit, Hitler was much older, he was very lazy, and I'm sure he asked Dr. Morel to help him along uh, when he went to bed with Eva Braun. But Hitler's passion was war and the conquest of Europe. The status of the Führer's personal physician advanced along with the German army. Hitler paraded before the propaganda cameras after the defeat of France. Theodor Morel, resplendent in uniform, was grinning right by his side. Perhaps it was jealousy that gave the portly doctor a novel nickname. There was a terrific proliferation of grandiose titles in the Third Reich. Almost everybody was Reich Master of this or Reich Master of that. Goering called Morel the Reich Master of the Injection or Reich Spritzenmeister. The general consensus of Morel's peers was that he was incompetent. He was a private physician in Berlin who just treated wealthy people. And when Hitler established that personal relationship with, with Morel and developed the trust in Morel, Hitler wouldn't let anyone else do anything about it. While others mocked Morel, Hitler grew more dependent on him and his daily jabs. He gave him injections of glucose because he felt that Hitler needed strengthening, he needed building up a bit. Hitler was a vegetarian who had a fairly miserable diet. We have the menus that were uh, made up for him for Christmas Day, for example, which are just terrible. Morel's vast menu of medications seemed even worse. Strychnine, or rat poison, in the Führer's anti-gas pills, and oil originally used to clean gun barrels in another gastric medication that had been banned for human consumption. Yet it may have been Hitler's dietary obsessions that exacerbated his stomach cramps, bloating, and excess gas. Perhaps a dull vegetarian diet of muesli, mashed potato, and soups made his agonizing flatulence even worse. Apple cake was one of the Führer's rare indulgences. And while he seems to have swallowed whatever Morel administered, exercise was out of the question. Morel was always trying to get Hitler to exercise, and Hitler just said he didn't have the time. When Hitler was on the Oberzeltsberg in his mountain retreat in Bavaria, he did go for walks in the fresh mountain air, but it was always downhill. And when he got to the bottom of the hill, he had a car taking him up again. While his chauffeur drove him up hills, it seems amphetamines may have lifted the Führer up when he was weary or feeling low. Morel occasionally prescribed amphetamines for Hitler when he thought he was being too lethargic or not energetic enough. If so, Hitler wasn't the only one blitzed during the Blitzkrieg. Pervitin was a methamphetamine, delivering an explosive high. It was given to the German troops who invaded France through the narrow valleys of the Ardennes, driving their tanks through in long lines over three or four days to keep the tank drivers awake. They called it Panzerschokolade, or tank chocolate. It was also known as Stuka tablets uh, from the dive bombers it was given to the pilots. The war had only just begun when millions of the high-octane amphetamine pills were sent to the front lines in Poland. Hitler's sweet tooth 
is well documented, but did the Führer's fancy extend to Pervitin? The amphetamine is only mentioned once in Morel's records. That's where Morel writes about what he's given Hitler and mentions the word pervertin. Just that single time in the entire diary. Others have used this as a springboard. One historian suspects it's a mix-up. A word that looks like pervertin was really something very different. There was a remedy called perandrin in the Third Reich. It was a testosterone-based product, licensed in 1937. It's a sex hormone, and that's what it was. It means perandrin and not pervitin. Whatever fueled his drive, Hitler was riding high in 1941. He launched more than three million troops into a devastating surprise attack on the Soviet Union. Morel moved in and established pharmaceutical factories in the Czech Republic and the Ukraine. He made various medicines for the German army. One of them was even advertised on a Nazi newsreel. Überall im Osten und Südosten Europas finden wir eine stark verlauste Bevölkerung, die eine ständige Gefahr für unsere Soldaten ist. Das Fleckfieber gehört zu den gefürchtetsten Kriegsseuchen, das sich bei Verlausung einer Truppe außerordentlich rasch ausbreitet und sehr viel Todesopfer fordert. Mit Russlapuder, der einfach zwischen die Wäsche gestreut wird, hat man gute Erfolge erzielt. I don't know if Morel abused his power. He certainly enjoyed his power because it brought him great wealth. When he was able to build those large pharmaceutical factories, he was able to get great wealth from those factories. And so having that personal relationship with Hitler was economically important to him. Fired up with pervertin and perhaps dusted with Professor Morel's anti-lice powder, the German army seemed unstoppable. Hitler advanced eastwards, directing his generals from a new headquarters in East Prussia, the so-called Wolf's Lair. But just when the Führer seemed to be flying high, the dictator was brought down by a sudden bout of dizziness. Morel recorded an emergency call in his notes. 7th of August, 1941 been summoned by telephone and to go to the Führer at once. He has suddenly felt dizzy. Diagnosing dysentery and high blood pressure, Morel also ordered an ECG or electrocardiogram. The results were sent to a heart specialist. The alarming verdict was coronary sclerosis, a potentially deadly narrowing of the major heart vessels. It was a disastrous diagnosis for patient A. The Führer at risk of a heart attack at one of the most critical stages of the war. The electrocardiogram showed he had an abnormally high blood pressure, and that's something that he didn't want anybody to know about. He wanted that to be kept quiet, and Morel kept very quiet about it. Morel administered nitroglycerin pills, which can ease, but do not cure heart problems. He feared the worst, but modern analysis suggests Hitler's heart was probably OK. Hitler did not have a serious heart condition. He suffered from high blood pressure, but it wasn't of a level that would cause heart attacks. There's one record of him having a fainting fit, but just to call that a heart attack is an exaggeration. There's no evidence for it. A week after his faint spell, Hitler was back on his feet. His heart didn't fail him, but the same couldn't be said for his once unstoppable legions. German forces were fighting an increasingly desperate battle on the Eastern Front. The vital arteries of supply 
became overstretched across the vast Soviet steppes. The German advance froze in icy winters. The Russians fought back, and as the tables turned, the strain was etched on the Fuhrer's face. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels noted, in three and a half years, Hitler seems to have aged 15. Yet, while his troops capitulated, the dictator's health held out. His sixth army was crushed at Stalingrad. In contrast, the Führer appeared to be fighting fit. Nach der Following the costly defeat at Stalingrad, where one could have expected him to collapse, he's hardly affected by it at all. It was almost perverse. After the Battle of Stalingrad, Hitler was healthier than he'd been for years. Perhaps it was because Hitler was high, like some of his soldiers on the battlefields below. There was one infamous instance where the Führer appeared to be flying on some kind of amphetamine high. Months after the defeat at Stalingrad, Hitler faced another disaster unfolding in Italy. As Allied troops advanced from landings in Sicily in July 1943, the Führer met his wavering Axis ally Benito Mussolini in northern Italy. Hitler was determined to stop the Italian dictator changing sides. The meeting shattered the regal setting of the stately Villa Pagani Gaggia. We can be pretty sure that Morel gave some tablets to Hitler when he went to see Mussolini, because all the descriptions of him at that meeting are he's just hyperactive, completely hyper in every way, talking, gabbling, clearly on speed. Even news of the Allied bombing of Rome didn't stop Hitler talking. An officer in the German entourage later wrote, embarrassed, people turned away. Perhaps an explanation lay inside the gold wrapper of yet another medication from Dr. Morell. At that time, Hitler was on six tablets of Vita Multin every day, and what was in Vita Multin changed according to what Morell wanted. All the reports we have of that meeting with Mussolini when Hitler was waving his arms about, talking 15 to the dozen and so on, do suggest that he may well have had a dose of amphetamines beforehand. The mysterious Vita Multin was one of up to 28 different potions and pills Hitler swallowed every day, but none of them could relieve the terminal defeat that lay ahead. The Allies landed in Normandy in June 1944. Hitler's besieged armies were now fighting a war on three fronts. The Russians were closing in on his Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia. Yet the Fuhrer continued to direct a losing battle unaware that some of his own generals were conspiring against him. The wolf's lair was supposed to be impregnable, yet the conspirators were able to place a bomb under the table, next to the Führer himself. ist der Schauplatz des verbrecherischen Anschlages, den ein kleiner Kreis gewissenloser Offiziere am 20. Juli auf den Führer und auf den Stab der Wehrmachtführung verübte. Ein gerechtes Schicksal hat das Verbrechen missglücken lassen. 
With Hitler out of the way, the army officers behind the plot had planned to announce their coup to the country. But it was Hitler who appeared on the newsreels, alive and in control, getting on with the business of directing the war and his Axis ally Mussolini. Hitler was very lucky. He was standing behind a very heavy wooden table. The hut was rather flimsy, so a lot of the blast was dissipated through the floor and through the walls. The uh, blast certainly did catch Hitler. It burst his eardrums, and he had, for some time afterwards, severe headaches and hearing loss. He was able to act immediately afterwards, very decisively, to stop the plot and have the people who'd organized it arrested. While the arrest and torture of hundreds of suspects was underway, Hitler was filmed visiting his fellow survivors, an ear injury clearly visible. The Führer's doctor, Theodor Morell, was not immediately at hand. According to one report, Hitler was briefly treated by ear, nose and throat specialist, Dr. Erwin Giesing. His notes and x-rays of Hitler's head have survived. Dr. Giesing made a series of detailed claims about the Führer's medical treatment after the war. But the surgeon was apparently dismissed soon after his initial treatment of Hitler and seems to have spent little time with him. Nevertheless, Giesing claimed that the dictator's eardrums were perforated and that there was a lot of blood in the right ear canal. An X-ray also showed a white area on the left side of Hitler's face, a blockage suggesting chronic sinusitis. To ease the pain, Giesing claimed the Führer was given nose drops containing cocaine. Apparently, the surgeon did not share Dr. Morell's respect for patient confidentiality. He claimed that the Führer couldn't get enough of the supercharged nose drops, telling him, Doctor, put some more cocaine in my nose. There's no evidence at all that Hitler was addicted to cocaine. These reports came from Dr. Giesing after the war, and they're not credible in any way. To put it bluntly, he was a liar. After the war, Erwin Giesing was an outspoken critic of Hitler's personal physician. He's also alleged to have secretly sampled the anti-gas pills Morell administered to combat the dictator's agonizing flatulence. He's said to have suffered the same irritability and chronic stomach cramps that afflicted the Führer. The ingredients included strychnine, also used in rat poison. In small quantities, strychnine works as a stimulant. In higher doses, it can cause seizures and eventually death. Hitler's surgeon, Karl Brandt, was another vociferous critic, apparently horrified that Morell fed the Führer strychnine. Karl Brandt was the most prominent physician in Hitler's circle. He clearly thought that Morell was incompetent, and uh, he was worried that Morell was poisoning Hitler in some way. Karl Brandt openly accused Morell of negligence and tried to have him dismissed. Morell is said to have apologized profusely. Hitler remained fiercely loyal to his personal physician, who recorded his Führer's alleged statement of support in his notes. That these fools didn't even think about what they would have done to me. They must have known that you have saved my life several times over the last eight years. And how did I fare before that? All the doctors summoned had failed. Those who tried to have Morell sacked, including Karl Brandt, were themselves dismissed. And there may be some justification in Hitler's support for Morell.
There's no evidence that Morel was trying to kill Hitler. On the contrary, the dosage of the pills that he prescribed for Hitler contains 0.0046 of a gram of strychnine per pill, which is half the medically recommended dose of this particular kind of pill. All the remedies that he gave were medically conventional in medically conventional quantities. But there was one critical condition that Dr. Morell was late in diagnosing, a debilitating disease that mirrored the collapse of Hitler's crumbling Reich. By March 1945, the Red Army had already reached the banks of the Oder River, within reach of Berlin. The Eastern Front had collapsed. Defeat was inevitable. While the shattered remnants of SS and army units made their last stands, Hitler went underground in a vast concrete bunker under the Reich Chancellery Building in Berlin. Der Führer empfängt in seinem Hauptquartier den Reichsjugendführer Axmann mit einer Abordnung von 20 Hitlerjungen, die sich bei der Verteidigung ihrer Heimat besonders bewährt haben. It was one of the last times the Führer would be seen alive outside of his bunker. The propaganda film was supposed to show Hitler still in command, decorating brave young defenders of the Reich. But a critical part of the footage was deemed unfit for viewing, cut and presumably supposed to be destroyed. But this footage survived. It was found in an East German film laboratory in the 1970s. The clip clearly shows the shaking Hitler could no longer control. Hitler began to show symptoms of Parkinson's disease during the war. He had a shake in his left hand, and for a time that was cured, as it were, by the bomb that went off on July the 20th, 1944. As he said, um, that's not the way I would choose of curing it. But soon after that, the shaking came back on his right side. He began to drag his feet and shuffle. Um, he began to speak in a more flat, less animated sort of way normally, though fits of rage could still bring out the old Hitler. A comparison of newsreel footage shows how Parkinson's disease took hold. To the left, in 1940, Hitler stands upright, agile and in control. To the right, in 1944, the Führer is stooped and relatively slow. Morell first noted Hitler's tremor in 1941 and put it down to stress. It was only in the final days of the war that he made the correct diagnosis, shaking palsy, or Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's can impair thought processes as well as posture and muscle control. But witnesses claim Hitler's mind was sharp to the end. What we can't see is any diminution of mental energy or emotional energy. There's a, one occasion when Hitler broke down towards the end of the war and uh, admitted everything is lost, it's all going down the tubes, and told Speer that he and Eva Braun were going to commit suicide rather than fall into enemy hands. But then he pulled himself together and maintained this facade of belief that everything was going to be OK. I don't think that drugs or medical treatments had anything to do with that at all. But outside his bunker, it was not OK. By April 1945, the first Soviet units had reached Berlin. Street by street, the Red Army closed in for the final assault. The Third Reich was finished. There was no cure for the crushing defeat inflicted above. Hitler finally dismissed his personal physician, who was also ill, having suffered several strokes. Dr. Morell made it onto one of the last planes out of Berlin. He was eventually captured and interrogated, 
but not implicated in any war crimes. He died in Bavaria three years later. Hitler's former surgeon, Karl Brandt, tried to discredit Morell during and after the war. But it was he who was accused of the slaughter of the mentally and physically ill, including children. This is how people like Brandt could try and explain, after 1945, uh, the Holocaust, the crimes of Hitler, for which he, as a leading medical official in the mass murder of the mentally handicapped and ill, was actually himself partly responsible. Brandt was found guilty of crimes against humanity and executed in 1948. SS doctor Ludwig Stumpfegger also treated Hitler and was involved in brutal death camp experiments. He died in the ruins of Berlin. Another key figure in the Führer's medical care was his dentist, Hugo Blaschke. It seems that the concentration camp system may also have played a part in Nazi dentistry. Hugo Blaschke was the man who looked after Hitler's teeth. He starred in one of Eva Braun's home movies, wearing the uniform of an SS general. An incriminating document shows that Dr. Blaschke got his gold from the corpses of those murdered in the concentration camps. By 1943, he amassed a staggering 50 kilograms, around two and a half million US dollars worth in today's prices, pulled from the jaws of murdered victims. The gold was recycled and used for Blaschke's dental work. Adolf Hitler's medical care was dominated by the portly doctor dubbed Reichsmaster of Injections, Theodor Morell. He fed the Führer a vast array of preparations, pills, drugs and hormones, but it's unlikely that any of them had an effect on Hitler's sanity. 48 hours before his death, he dictated his will, as lucid and alert as ever. His thought processes had not been affected, and his mental capabilities were normal. Morell was accused of criminal negligence, but his treatments did not make Hitler lose his mind, or the war. What he did lose was a sense of reality. He just could not believe that Germany was being completely defeated. He was still directing the war, as the supreme commander, and he held meetings with his generals, and he would move the counters representing armies around on the map and so on, and the generals would say behind his back, because they didn't really dare to tell him, well, there's no troops there, you know, they've all gone, or there's only a few hundred, not the thousands that he thinks. There is no proof that Hitler was mentally ill or drug addicted. The dictator was afflicted with Parkinson's disease, but there's no evidence that it had any bearing on his military or political decisions. The alternative is harder to swallow. The man who destroyed millions of lives did so in the belief that his actions were sane and rational. The war didn't happen, and the Jews were not wiped out because Hitler was ill, but because most Germans followed his decisions. Hitler always knew what he was doing. He was compus mentis right up to the end. That, of course, is very convenient to Germans after the war, who could say, Hitler was a madman, we weren't responsible, he wasn't responsible, we can all kind of let ourselves off the hook. So I think it's very important to realize that he was, in all crucial, key, basic respects, perfectly sane. Whether his ideology was rational is a completely different question. We like to think, well, somebody who could do such monstrous things and commit such terrible crimes must be insane. And it poses much deeper and more difficult questions to us when we admit that he was not insane. History Night continues with the story of a young Polish-American pilot who made it his mission to avenge his ancestral homeland in brand new War Heroes of the Skies next.